Welcome to a webinar sponsored by Juniper Networks. Our focus today will be about NFE, the organization of the future transformed to deliver NFE solutions. We have a very exciting topic today and join with us a special guest from Amdocs. This webinar is part of an NFE webinar series focused on transformation management. Available online are three recordings for Solutions That Matter, Business Transformation, and Technology Transformation. Today's recording will be focused on the organization of the future. And lastly, we'll have another webinar on measuring the business impacts of virtualization. So I'd like to take a minute to introduce our presenters today. I'm Wayne Chung, Director of Product Marketing focused on NFE, and I'll be your host. With us, we have Jack Barrett and Justin Paul, and I'll have them introduce themselves to you. Jack? Yes, thank you, Wayne. Uh, certainly, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Jack Barrett. I am Senior Director for North American Service Provider Marketing, and today I'll provide a Juniper perspective on organizational transformation. Uh, we believe that as uh, technology evolves, uh, so much so should the organization in order to address the benefits of that technology. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Jack. And Justin? Hi, my name is Justin Paul. I'm the head of NFV and OSS Marketing for Amdocs based in Bath in the UK. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some of the challenges facing uh, service providers in the NFV space, um, the, the journey they have to go through, and also finishing off looking a little bit about how you monetize uh, NFV. And that's it from me. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Justin. We're super excited to have both of you. And on to the show. We have a very rich agenda today. The first two sections, the transform economics of networking and building the organization of the future will be covered by Jack Barrett. Next, we'll have the market observations, insight and observations that Justin Paul from Andox has seen with his NFE journeys. And last, I'll wrap up with a summary. And now, on to Jack. Thank you, Wayne. So let's start today with a discussion on the transformed economics of networking. I'd like to start here with the economics of networking because this becomes the ultimate objective of any technology organizational transformation. And NFE and SEN are transforming the economics of traditional networking business models. At the, start, at the top, it's about capacity planning. So when we talk about capital efficiency via software, it's addressing challenges in existing models today with capital planning, which is a top strategic priority for any business. Um, what you see here in the middle is the key areas that it addresses around demand uncertainty, um, uh, building out um, capacity to peak provisioning, and high fixed overheads, whether it be in a data center or in um, you know, campus and branch locations. The second area it addresses is around operational processes, and it drives operational efficiency via automation. An organization's operational processes is the ultimate heart of their business and how they do their business. The addresses three primary issues here is around time to deploy services, um, you know, moving that from six to ten months to you know, six, ten days to six weeks, you know, in that time frame. Service provisioning um, from, from weeks to days and service assurance in terms of ensuring the SLAs. And the last, uh, it really is around the business models, right? And this is created and enabled through service agility. Uh, no longer are carriers uh, restricted to you know, certain markets. They can extend services outside of the market through virtu virtualization technologies. They are no longer limited to service choices. They can add and, and take down services very quickly, and they can engage in new types of business models. The ultimate outcome here is shown on the right, so around capacity planning, want to increase the return on invested capital, and it also lowers a carrier's business risk entering new services. With operational processes, you want to look for things like faster time to market, reduce quote to cash, lower cost to serve your customers, lower acquisition costs, and of course lower supplier costs. And I think um, uh, Justin will talk about some of these in his section as well. And then finally, you know, the ultimate uh, objective here is profitable growth. You can do that through reducing your churn, uh, improved customer experience. Uh, and things like that. So those are the ultimate objectives of what we're trying to do to transform. So what we'll talk a little bit about now is how does the organizational transformation enable you to um, achieve these that business outcomes. 
So to get to those uh, objectives, as we just talked about, requires a holistic approach. Right? We talked about the transformation, the transformed economics at the top, right? And those are the business outcomes, right, that I just described around reducing cycle times and things of that nature. That's what's going to produce, you know, transformed economics. To do that, you need a network platform uh, that enables the capital efficiency and the operational efficiency. And of course, you need to drive and experiment in new business models to increase your customer relevance. That's how you will drive your top line growth. Underlying all this is an empowered organization. And what we mean by that is that an organization that has the skills, tools, and culture to embrace agility and innovation that these technologies enable. And it's important to look at it from this perspective because economics in, in any kind of um, financial sense is a lagging indicator. You don't really don't know if you've achieved those economics until you've gotten to a point where you've closed your books and you know, and and have have identified all the expenses. And this will come over a course of time, three to five years. You know, in most cases, you fully achieve those. The leading indicators is to ensure that you have the right skills and processes, culture in place to get there. So that is the first place uh, we believe a lot of carriers need to be thinking about starting. Uh, and moving in that direction uh, in order to achieve these economics. And in our point of view, a DevOps methodology or approach helps drive this organizational transformation because it identifies um, the skills and requirements and cultures uh, that a, a tr carrier needs to transform to and to, to achieve over time in order to get to those benefits. DevOps em emphasizes people and culture over tools and processes, and there is a significant and measurable payback, as, as shown here. Uh, it's a number of uh, carriers. There's a report by Puppet Labs uh, that shows a number of carriers here, a uh, no, number of industries, excuse me, here, and there's significant benefits that can be gained in the tech and telecom industry. Many of the quantifiable benefits they, they addressed or found in their surveys were around shorter development cycles, Increased relevance. Um, I'm sorry. Increased release velocity. Improved uh, defect detection. So finding more things more quickly. Uh, failure rates. Time to recover. These are all the things that will start to transform the organization. But you need the underlying skills and capabilities. However, you know we want to make sure that uh, we understand that carriers and telcos need to take a, a nuanced approach. Um, and transforming, seeing, transforming a legacy infrastructure between processes, network, and culture uh, must balance kind of the existing, you know, trust and availability, um, you know, that carriers bring to their customers with this new technology of rapid innovation and prototyping. Okay, let's now talk about how we actually build the organization of the future. So there are four aspects to organizational transformation. The first relates to the stakeholders. And here the important aspect is to define uh, organizational roles and responsibilities. It's very clear that you know, certain organizations take on certain roles and responsibilities. The second, and we alluded to this earlier, is assessing the influence of automation and DevOps on business processes. Um, because the technology needs to support the business process. And that, that's one of the key things that we, we really try to drive in our conversations with our customers. And that will also then drive the next one, which is what are the critical skill sets you need to build? These are involved around developing new software skills and related methodologies like DevOps and, and Agile. You know, a lot of these methodologies came out of lean manufacturing techniques and are now being applied to software and are, are showing to be very effective here. And the last but not least is establishing a a culture that embraces collaboration and innovation. So starting uh, with the roles and responsibilities, on the left-hand side of this chart, you see the four primary um, areas of, an, of any organization. Today, the current role of the CTO is, is traditionally around network operations and engineering. And uh, what we see them evolving to is more of a future focus type of role. Um, this is around creating uh, technology standards, uh, establishing future standards, uh, a technology that they need to build in their system, and very importantly, uh, migrating from legacy systems. Right? That's going to be a critical aspect of the transformation. How do you um, systematically and efficiently migrate from your legacy networks? Focus areas for the CTO organization is really should be around driving capital efficiency, taking that risk out of the business, migration costs, and ensuring that the platform is open and scalable. That really is a strategic 
um, differentiation going forward that will enable carriers to be very agile. So that's a very important role in the CTO. The CIO today very focused on applications, enterprise-wide applications in particular, data center, software methodologies. Those are the types of areas that will start to grow and more influence as carriers start to embrace more of these software technologies for service delivery. In this sense, the CIO now takes on an operations focus. So some of this focus may shift from the CTO organization to the CIO organization. Um, and their, their real responsibilities here would be around developing software architectures, streamlining the DevOps uh, process, and ensuring security and compliance. And I can't underestimate the importance of that last bullet in ensuring that security is, is enforced, you know, not just from a policy and regulatory uh, perspective, but from an internal policy and data protection perspective throughout the organization. The focus here will be reducing cycle times for critical organizational processes like service fulfillment, uh, automation uh, of tools and techniques to drive down labor costs and or, and or improve productivity and addressing security risks. Uh, the CMO organization, and here I'm, I'm using the CMO organization in general as any customer facing uh, touch points. Right? So this can be sales, CMO, support services, things of that nature. Um, as opposed to just having a set of random touch points today, or not random touch points, but customer touch points today, their focus shifts to a solutions focus. Um, they need to be able to quickly um, put together new solutions for their customers, define and improve the customer experience, and evolve the brand. Uh, and I'll talk about this later in terms of extending the brand from a, a connectivity-oriented brand today to a solutions-oriented brand. Key focus areas and objectives for them would be around life cycle, uh, customer lifetime value, uh, customer experience, and new products and services. And finally, the CFO is more and more involved in these types of decisions. In traditional business models where you deployed capacity, those business models and those financial models are very well known. Software with variable costs, CapEx, OpEx costs, uh, all start to disrupt these models. So the CFO now will become more engaged in order to ensuring that the network investments are being used to grow the business profi profitably. And they need to start to solve for software as an asset. You'll see things like deferred revenue. You'll see things like OPEX, you know, conversion and things of those nature, things of that nature. Uh, and then so their focus areas will be, really be around what is my exposure, what's my business risk, what's my OPEX versus CAPEX implications. You know, if I convert some CAPEX to OPEX, how do I reduce my existing OPEX so that I still maintain my margins and improve those over time? And then really what are the new business models we need to engage in and what will be the impact of those business models on the corporation. The next step in the process is to adopt uh, an agile approach to service development. Right? So once the, the requirements are defined, you need to be able to start to think about how we are going to roll out new services. On the left-hand side is a traditional waterfall model um, that usually takes you know, months or years to implement. And you know, the key thing to point out there is development owns a big part of the process in the beginning and then sort of starts to throw it over the wall uh, by the end of the operations. Um, on the right-hand side is an agile development methodology. And in sharp contrast, development and operations works together jointly um, to roll out new services. So there are variations on this theme, but if you really start at the, you know, kind of, uh, the, the top left-hand side, the first thing um, these, these teams need to do is to define the requirements. And these are not really strict requirements, and they're not, uh, it's just kind of a starting point. Define what you want to do, you design it, you build it, you test it, you deploy it, and you analyze it, right? And that becomes one cycle. Then you start that whole cycle over, right? You can refactor what you just did, or you can start to develop new circles, um, new, new services. And it becomes a circular, you know, sometimes you see this as a, you know, starting an endpoint and starting to wind out, outward because it gets bigger and bigger as time goes on. And that's really the, the agile approach um, to service delivery. So how does this work in reality? So on paper that's great, but how do we build this on a network platform? And so here's an illustrative example of a uh, service fulfillment process for traditional CPE services. And I believe Justin will, will talk more about how this can be built from an OSS, BSS perspective later in the, in the presentation. Um, but on the left-hand side, you see the traditional approach. And again, you know, variations on the theme in terms of 
of you know every company may do this slightly differently. But if you if you stage this in a waterfall approach, you know you, you order your equipment, um, the equipment gets shipped, gets delivered, you get it connected, somebody you know, plugs it in, and turns it on, then you have some testing and uh, you know assurance testing, to make sure everything's set up, you know configuration management, and then you actually turn up the service in the carrier. And this typically takes four to six weeks in a in a CPE environment. When you shift over to the right hand side, you create this. Um, I, I like to call it a, a, a network as a service platform, whether you sell the services externally or, or not, um, doesn't really matter. You could be basically uh, selling your services internally to your internal marketing organization to develop new services. But what you need to do is you start to automate the workflows across the top, right? So for every workflow, like auto management, provisioning, customer care, policy control, whatever the workflows are that you need to drive for a service, you start to automate those with a set of APIs. And those set of APIs essentially define a service delivery platform. And, and those are based on models of the service that you want to, want to develop. Um, and the nuance here is that you know, there are certain things in a carrier environment that ne can't necessarily be automated, right? But the idea here would be to automate as much as you can. So if you're putting up a microwave link or something like that, you can automate a lot of the processes. But then there'll be a, a pause where you have to send somebody out to do a site, manual site inspection or get you know, regulatory approval for something. So it takes a little bit of a nuanced approach, and that's that manual component at the bottom. So the idea here is to create as much as you can on what we're calling a DevOps compliant layer through a set of exposed APIs and models or profiles of the services, and then understand what parts of the service you know, can be uh, automated and what, what needs to remain manual. So while a six-week process may not get done in, in minutes, you know, it still may go from six weeks or four weeks to 72 hours or something like that. That's, those are the types of transformations that we're looking for. So we just went over a quick example on a fulfillment process, but if you look at it holistically, it's really important to influence, to understand the influence on business and operations processes um, in a much broader sense. If you look at this, the gray boxes represent you know, a, it's, it's, it's a TM form model of a, a services organization that shows the major operational processes to drive business. Right? On, on, from left to right, it starts with planning, uh, infrastructure management, product lifecycle management, and then it goes into more customer facing um, you know, a ca you know, quote to cash type processes with around fulfillment, uh, readiness, fulfillment, assurance, and billing. So as you go from left to right, you really think through a kind of a development, you know, um, from idea to cash type of process. When you look across the horizontal bars, you're really looking up at the market and facing. So that top horizontal bar here is around marketing and offer management, and then customer relationship management on the right. And as you go further down, you talk about uh, supplier management. So, you know, understanding your, you know, idea to cash processes from left to right, that impact, and understanding how you affect the market and how you affect your suppliers, is really kind of the the, uh, <clears throat> the four areas that that need to be addressed here. When we overlay the influence of uh, NFD and SDN, you know, these shaded areas and and the depth of the color uh, really identifies the the greater impact. Uh, this is where we think consideration for SE and NFE needs to be taking um, place uh, in a very holistic way to get the maximized benefit of these technologies. Just focusing on you know fulfillment, you know, and automating you know a customer portal is one thing, but if you really don't look at this thing from a complete business uh, process perspective, we think uh, you may be selling yourself short in the long term. And I think this is a, a really good case in point that actually NFV and SDN are such disruptive technologies um, that they have an impact very much on the business and operational processes. And probably the biggest area of impact is around the fulfillment and the assurance uh, uh, area. And it really does radically change the way operators have to think and address these technologies if they're really to get the maximum benefit out of them. Thank you, Justin. And you know, the last point on this one is we, 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 we're not, we don't want to underestimate the magnitude of this transformation. Um, 
you know, so we want to make sure we're, we're clear on that this is this is a challenge ahead. But later on, we will be talking about some very pragmatic first steps. Like for any journey, there's some very pragmatic things you can start to do to get down this path. So this drives the conversation in about what are the skills and capabilities that need to be built into this new organization. And we're just giving you a sampling here of kind of three key areas. Uh, starting with the process uh, skills and capabilities, uh, knowledge around agile methodologies, value stream mapping. Again, you, you saw the, all the different tasks um, you know, that were identified. Each of those would click down multiple layers in terms of the detail. Um, value stream, looking at those processes um, to look at the value stream mapping um, in terms of you know, where is value being created and not as opposed to these. I highly recommend that being kind of the first step. There are other new processes maybe around development of new business models that might require um, more process reengineering. And this is when necessary because it's a much broader and impacting. And the, and the third process is how do you incorporate and bring in third party applications? One of the key tenets of this transformation is the ability to be open you know, and drive open innovation with third parties. You have to have a process and a capability to bring those in in a very uh, efficient way. From a worker perspective, um, you know, uh, skill sets around SDN engineering and automation tools. This is a big area. Every time I turn around, there seems to be a new automation tool on the market. Virtual, virtualization technologies and stacks. You know, you no longer just, when I talk about a stack here, you're no longer just talking about a piece of software. You're talking about storage. You're talking about tools. You're talking about servers. You're talking about data centers. All of that constitutes a stack. Uh, cloud orchestration, um, in order to ensure that you have uh, services uh, orchestrated from the cloud out across the, the premise. And of course, building and enabling APIs and third-party integration. That goes with the process uh, and ecosystem support I talked about earlier. But you have to have the ability in a platform to expose the APIs to efficiently uh, integrate these third parties. And the one on the right here is building around collaboration tools. You know, again, methodology and ensuring that these organizations are working collaboratively uh, to roll out these new services. And I'll set up the next. So uh, last but not least, it's about extending the culture. Uh, and, and here I'm, I'm very explicit about extending the culture. Right? There are many attributes of the service provider culture, especially around the trust and the reliability uh, of, of the organizations that I, I believe still need to be embraced. Um, internally speaking, you know, uh, however, you know, carriers are more engineering focused, very, very focused on the network and design and building new services. Externally, it's more of a connectivity-focused orientation you know, for services. What they need to start to do are shown in the white boxes below. right? So on the internal focus, and I, again, I always look at two aspects of the culture, the internal culture and the externally facing culture. In the internal culture, we have, you have to get very comfortable with experimentation, software-centric as opposed to hardware-centric you know, business models, and collaboration. That, that's a big, you know, um, uh, thing when you shift from waterfall to uh, agile methodologies externally, and this is what's going to define the brand uh, in the end here. Um, you know how how responsive um, uh, are they to customer needs? How quickly can they respond to customer needs? Take on a solutions orientation, not just hey, you know, we, we set up the connectivity, the rest is yours. How do we extend that all the way into the prem? And seamless customer experience from sales, from engineering. To customer support, to, you know, to post, you know, sale, uh, make that a very seamless customer experience um, because that's what uh, we believe the customers are asking for. Um, and what this really the, the creates here is a culture that embraces the customer's experience because that's I think will be the differentiator uh, of the future. Uh, Wayne, at this point, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Jack, thank you for that insightful um, overview, really, of this transformation that we're seeing around the organization. What I found really interesting was some of the things you talked about in terms of the processes around service development to operations and the business side of it blended with the, the skill sets upskilling that we're hearing so much about in the industry and then embedding that into the cultures by which you're taking this thing out to market. What I'm really interested in is now handing this over to Justin. 
who will present the market observations that he's seen in this industry. Justin? Thank you. So if we look at some of the market observations, I think the first thing to note is that for the service providers, um, times are tough. In fact, they're fighting two battles today. Um, the first battle is around a better experience, and the second is around better services. So in the past, service providers have traditionally had, with some exceptions, a limited amount of um, conflict and uh, competition within their markets. And what we've seen in recent years is the emergence of the so-called over-the-top players, um, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, companies that have a very different business model, a very different approach to innovation, who are very much coming into the service provider's domain and starting to address uh, services that are certainly seen as the service provider's domain, and in some cases, providing them much better than the service provider's been able to do in the past. And that's the first battleground, is how to compete against the service providers. And, of course, the second area of competition is um, how to adjust to the changing expectations of your customers. So customer expectations in terms of bandwidth, network quality, uh, etc., have really increased over recent years. And customers want more and more services. They want them better. They want them much more tailored to their, uh, their needs. And what this has really shown is a, a lack of um, service agility, a big impact on the service providers. They have long service introduction life cycles today. Um, their service operations processes tend to be very complex. And of course, this leads to very long times to market for new services. Uh, and probably more importantly than that, a, a very high cost to innovate today. So let's have a look at the service provider's NFV journey and try and understand the domains that are impacted by NFV. I think if you look down the domains, you have the technology and product domain, um, the operational organization and the organization of the business, um, the customer services and business models, and the commercial models that underlie that. And I think it's fair to say that NFV and SDN touch all of those areas. And the way the uh, service provider is, is rolling out these services, they're starting on the vision and strategy. And that's the first uh, part of their journey, is to build the NFV vision, build the strategy, to understand where they need to go and some of the changes that are going to take place. And then once they've done that, the next phase is looking at the transformation and implementation of these technologies. They are significant. It's more than just a technology transformation. It really is a business transformation. And you can see here, um, as you adopt NFV and SDN technology, you also have to change your operational model. You have to change the way your customer services organization works. And finally, you have to change the commercial and legal model. And I'll give you some examples of this. So. Today, um, service innovation, the engineering aspects of that are very much the critical part. They're the bit that take the longest. And traditionally, the marketing organizations, the customer services organizations, have not been put under pressure um, by innovation because the work they have to do to bring new solutions to market is significantly less than that involved in the engineering space. But when you have NFV, when you have a huge degree of automation, the ability to onboard virtual network functions, potentially the engineering component is no longer the critical path. And you're, you're, you're left with service providers wanting to know whether they can actually address the commercial aspects of their business and the customer service aspects of the business as fast as they can address the engineering aspects, which typically been the bottleneck. We're also seeing some interesting dialogues around the commercial and legal side of things. Uh, NFV allows you to instantiate, build um, multiple new versions, multiple new virtual machines 
for software on demand. But what are the legal and commercial implications of that? Potentially, using the old models for license fees, uh, you could have one mad moment, one, one Black Friday, where you suddenly triple, quadruple, uh, or even go to 10 times your normal annual spend on licenses um, in, in one go, and you have to address the models around that. And once you've th thought about those things, the final thing you have to address is the operational issues. Um, in, once you've uh, worked out what you're going to do, you have to operate these networks. And NFB itself, SDN itself, very simple technologies. They work very, very in a very straightforward manner. Uh, they've got a high degree of automation. Uh, the systems understand what they, uh, what they need to do. But actually, when you start to try and superimpose those systems over the existing legacy technologies, and some of those legacy technologies are things like LTE Advanced, uh, Fiber to the Home, G.Fast, so technology is still heavily being invested by operators, uh, you have some significant operational challenges. So there is a significant journey for the operator. So to illustrate this point further, we know that NFV enables rapid, low-cost innovation, but are the organizations of today physically structured to support this change? So if we look at the way things are done today, I mean, typically you have a uh, traditional waterfall process for service development. So you move from the product management organization who do the product definitions, uh, service designers who design those definitions. They then hand on to the operational team who uh, work out the resource definitions. It moves to testing and delivery and then out of the engineering space into the, um, the, the commercial aspects of service design. But when you move to, um, new, move to an NFV and SDN domain, you have a much more automated model. But actually, what you see is all of these organizations now have to work in tandem. Um, and you have a, effectively a continuous feedback loop of analysis, modeling, testing, packaging back to the start. The great thing about this is it enables you to build services very quickly, and also adapt and modify services so you could have multiple variants in a very short time. Understanding that then means that for operations, that, you know, the key for successful network transformation is really that operational layer. And unless you fully adopt the DevOps side of things, um, you can't really achieve this. So finally, and perhaps most importantly, when you start to look at um, NFV and the transformation within the business, at some point you have to ask yourself, is it actually worth doing this transformation? And we did um, a significant amount of work earlier on this year with Analysis Mason to try and understand whether there was a compelling business case for some of the early use cases for NFV. And when we looked at the, um, the, the enterprise uh, VPN space, what we found was actually there was a significant business case surrounding uh, NFV. And you can see here some of the breakdown around that. So 47% um, site savings per year, across an operator with 110 sites. So a site would be an office or a premises in the enterprise domain, and probably something like 1.35 billion in cost savings from implementing this technology. Certainly, that means NFV SDN is something that's, that's worth getting out of bed for. But when we drilled down even further, and you started to look at where those cost savings could be made, it was very interesting. So supplier management was the largest area of cost savings. The ability to use COTS hardware, uh, share hardware, implement faster, gave you 42% savings in the supplier management space. Critical for any new business is the impact NFV SDN has on the order to cash cycle times. So today, 
uh, the industry is really uh, handicapped by the amount of time it takes to implement some of these NFB services and, and then bill for those services and receive the money for those services. Because with NFB and SDN, you have almost instant uh, fulfillment of services, it has a significant impact on your order to cash cycle times. So you're able to bill faster and receive the money faster, and that's really key. And then in terms of how to make your customers happy, um, time to resolve um, had a significant impact as well. So the benefits of NFV SDN is that actually you can significantly reduce the number of calls, um, you're able to deal with things in a much faster time, and the mean time to fix a fault was significantly reviewed, reduced. And last but by no means least, we actually found using this technology, you have to send less engineers to site, uh, to building premises, to work on things, and that had a significant impact, not only on the costs of delivering those services, but more importantly on how you resolve those. So what we found was, overall, the, the business case for NFV was extremely positive. And what I would say is, we have a business case, uh, if you want to understand more about what the business case is, how it's worked out, some of the details and the granularity of it, um, please go along to the website nfvreadyoss.com where you can download a copy of the case there. So that's it from a market observations point of view, and I'm going to hand back over to Wayne. Thank you, Justin, for your insight and observations. I think the audience will find that truly valuable in terms of what you've seen along the NFE journey. And Jack, thank you very much for painting the picture for what the organization of the future will be required to do. Justin and Jack have provided us some great insights on this transformation. The observation that I see is that this is no easy task, but as I'd say, if there's no pain, there's no gain. So what are customers looking for? They're looking for a partner that they can truly trust and bring their experiences into this journey. Now, what are some of those attributes? First, openness. The ability to integrate other components together, either they be third-party components, building on top of APIs, and also bringing on standardization of protocols. This is a key element to this transformation. This leads us to interoperability. So being able to stitch all of these components together requires a place for them to evaluate. This is what Juniper brings in terms of our open lab infrastructure so that they can begin to realize these transformational tasks. Next also is the trans technology alliance partners, such as the one we have with Amdocs, to be able to bring the best of multiple vendors together to deliver the best solution possible. This leads us to the Dev DevOps approach to be able to bring the technology, business, and operational practices together to roll out new services faster. This is what this partnership allows us to do. Now, a couple places have quoted some recent successes that Juniper has had. At Networking World, we, they talk about our disaggregated approach, a bold new approach to taking on transformation. Light Reading voted us one of the most trusted vendors in the community. And a customer of ours, Symantec, saying that we're building these best practices and bringing them to their um, operations and being a true technology partner as well as a business and operational partner. So if you found this webinar interesting and you're looking to take actions now, here are some things you can do. Start with experimenting. Get familiarized with SDN and NFE technologies. Bring these capabilities into your lab and start to figure out what you can actually do with this technology. Second, alignment. Start to look across your organizations and figure out how to break down barriers so that all departments are on the same page towards the execution. Next, grow your skill sets. Grow your processes. Expand the ways that you're doing things and enhance it with a more agile and faster methodologies to bring capabilities and services to market. Next, extend your approach, looking at really an introspect of your cultural models 
to be able to uh, uh, endorse really a new DNA to build greater business agility. And last, leverage partners like Juniper and Andocs who have really gone through these different journeys with our service provider customers in this transformation and let us help you to expedite this process. So I invite you to take a look more around the organizational transformation and other aspects around this transformational journey. At Juniper, we have our NFV solutions page at the following link. And Amdocs has their NextGen OSS homepage where you'll be able to find out a whole lot more in this transformation journey. Thank you for your time in listening to our webinar today. This concludes our webinar for today. I'd like to pay special thanks to our strategic alliance partner, Amdocs, specifically Justin Paul for his insights and observations, and as well Jack Barrett from Juniper Networks on his programmatic approach to structuring the organization of the future. Join us next time for a webinar on how to measure business impact of virtualization. And until then, I invite you to visit our Juniper Networks webpage on the big NFE idea to find out a whole lot more.